was an important feature of avian disease. Poor diet and even balanced diet was at the root of a lot of problems that we encountered. And almost 25 years ago, Malcolm and his wife Sally founded the Bird Care Company based on a lot of his uh, degree work and an interest in bird keeping from a very early age. And he's established this successful company producing supplements and medications for birds which have proved very successful. And I, he's going to tell us all about nutrition in cage and avian birds and their health. Thank you. Malcolm. Thank you, Alan. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Thank you, John, for inviting me. That's very kind of you. Um, I'm not used to standing up with slide presentations and microphones and things like that. I normally go to a bird club and just wave my arms around and shout a lot and whatever. So I am a bit more informal than maybe it will appear today. Um, if any of you can't hear me, if the microphone sort of drifts down there because I forget about it, just wave, shout, whatever. Just um, This is for your benefit much more than it is for mine. Um, I'm just going to try tonight, today, tonight, this morning, whatever. Um, I, I, I did only get off a plane from Australia on Thursday night, so I've got every excuse for this being rubbish. Um, I'm going to try and talk about two things. Um, I guess because they're my primary hobby horses, and I think uh, they both touch on the comment that Alan made, which is a lot of bird keeping problems, a lot of bird health problems, relate to poor nutrition. And obesity uh, is the biggest cause of premature death, I believe, in, in captive birds. Um, and calcium, calcium is our speciality. We're really good with calcium. We understand calcium better than most people, uh, which means we don't understand it very well at all. But, uh, <laughs> But, but it's a huge, huge factor in, in bird health. So let's just touch on obesity to start with. Um, it's no different for your parrot as it is for you and I carrying more than we should do. Um, we, we all suffer the same problems and the risks are exactly the same. Your birds may die of heart disease, liver disease, diabetes. The vets probably have a fancier term for that for, for birds, do you, Alan? I know the horse vets do, they're terrible. And I've put here death in middle age. Yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> and, and death in middle age to me is the key thing when it comes to parrots because you know all of the large and medium sized parrots, the African greys and the Amazons and the macaws, they should be living to 65 or thereabouts and zillions of them die in their 40s or less. So what are the key causes of, of obesity? And this is the, the biggest one in, in a way because loads and loads of people are focused on trying to feed their birds the diet that that type of bird would eat in the wild. There's only a simple, really simple problem with that. If you take an African grey parrot and let's say you feed it sunflower seed and sunflower seed has an incredibly similar nutritional profile to the palm nuts that, that African greys would eat in the wild. But there is a difference. The African grey that's sitting on your shoulder probably flies about five yards a day. The African grey in the wild flies about 50 miles a day. So they burn up a huge amount more energy and calories than your captive bird does. So if you feed your very sedentary captive bird on a wild type diet, it will get fat. There's no alternative for it. Too much starch and sugar, and I've put this in for a reason, um, and I'm going to just go quickly to the next one, which is insufficient protein. We'll come back to the starch and sugar in a minute. Insufficient protein, that sounds a bit strange, um, but I will explain in more detail, quite a lot of detail, in fact you may get fall asleep while I'm doing it, um, why insufficient protein itself <laughs> becomes a problem. And perhaps more importantly, the quality of the protein that we feed to our birds is a major problem. Okay, this looks a bit complicated. Probably is a bit complicated, I've got to remember. I've, I've used, I, I, I struggle with numbers, so, so I've used millet 
as my sort of example. I know you don't, you guys don't feed millet to your birds very much, but I used to be a finch man, not a parrot man. So uh, millet's very easy. It's 10% protein, and 10 is a really easy number to work with. Just take this top line here. This is the target amount of energy we want our bird to, to consume to be a happy, healthy parrot. It doesn't matter whether my number of 330 calories is accurate or not. It really doesn't matter. But that's, that's our target. If you feed it millet, then millet is 10% protein. And let's just, for the sake of argument, assume that 10% protein is exactly right for your parrot. There's only one problem with this. And that is that birds, oh, sorry, um, the protein in your plant foods like millet or fruit or vegetables or anything else you feed that's not an animal or an insect, uh, your bird can't use it all. It can only use about 60% of it. So actually, although that 10% protein looks fine, in reality it's not. So in reality, these birds, if you constrained them and they couldn't eat more than that level of energy, they would suffer from protein deficiency. You tend to find that'll show up as things like birds that don't molt properly. That's probably the biggest issue. Um, and they might not be carrying good muscling and, and things like that. If we... Uh, the simplest answer to, to solving that problem is simply to feed them more food. And, and if we do that, what you can see is the immediate problem, yeah, we feed them nearly, nearly double the amount of food, that gets the protein bit right, but gee, look, we're now feeding them vastly too many calories. This is what causes your birds to get fat. It's what causes us to get fat, let's be honest. We all eat more than we should, um, and, we, and we probably don't eat as much protein as we should, so our birds and we are not that different. So. There are a couple of different ways of, of solving this problem. Um, you can feed a diet with food ingredients that have much higher protein levels. And you'll see uh, a lot in the parrot pellets, you see lots of things like soya, which is sort of 40% protein. And so you can create a diet that has enough protein, in fact, more than enough protein for the amount of calories. There's a fundamental problem with this, though. And that is, if you remember, the bird can't utilize all of that protein. So we're now giving it 17% protein. It's got the 10 it needs. It's got 7 it's got to get rid of. Um, if the bird is fit and healthy, that is not a problem. right? That is absolutely fine. But if its kidneys or its liver are not functioning properly, that can be a challenge. So. This, to me, is not the right solution. The other, uh, one of the other reasons I don't like this solution is it tends to use things like soya. Soya is full of uh, estrogen-like um, hormones, and effectively you're giving your bird a whole pile of female sex hormones. And, and, and I'm not very keen on that, especially for the males. It's probably okay for the girls. So this is an alternative way of doing it, and this is, um, if I go back to my statement that the, the birds can only use about 60% of the protein we're feeding them, that's actually because plant proteins lack a couple of things called essential amino acids, in particular lysine and methionine are the most commonly limiting amino acids. Um, and if we feed uh, a, a, an adequate protein diet plus amino acids, these amino acids, hey presto, we can actually get the birds to utilize almost all of the protein in their diet. So this gives us the right level of calories, the right level of energy in the diet, the right level of protein in the diet, and all we've done is add a minuscule quantity of two to amino acids, which are totally natural, they're things that, that, that we have in our diet, but we simply don't have enough of them. Any vegetarians or vegans in the room will have this same problem, by the way. So, if any of you want a full explanation of amino acids, I would normally 
go into a lot more detail than that, but I haven't got very long today. So if you want to talk to me about it, either after the talk or down at our stand down below, I'm more than happy to go into more, more, um, more detail for you. This is another one of my hobby horses. I think that we see a zillion times we read that, oh, some flowers full of oils and fats and it's horrible, horrible stuff. Um, and, and this is where I get a bit upset, to be honest, with the whole nutrition industry. I don't mean just the bird nutrition or animal nutrition and human nutrition. We've all been told that fat is the enemy. So is it? Well, the first thing is that fats are not the enemy. Um, and we are only just beginning to be told that by the human nutritionists even. Um, there is no hormone in our bodies, and I'm talking us as well as birds now, there is no hormone in our bodies that tells us to take the fat that we eat, or the oils that we eat, and store it away as fat. We all know the hormone that does turn starch into fat, because we've all heard of insulin. So you are actually going to get much fatter and your birds will get much fatter if you feed them sugars and starches which get stored away as fats very, very efficiently. So if you want to put weight on, or if you want your bird to put weight on, or if you want your dog or cat to put weight on, feed them sugars and starches and insufficient protein. Because this insulin is what converts those sugars and starches into fats. Now, fats do get stored, you know, that, but it's a much slower process and it's a much less damaging process. And you'll find nowadays loads of people on uh, low carb diets or uh, virtually zero carb diets because they're cutting out the sugars and starches. So this is a way of looking at, at sunflower, if you like. Um, so this is my millet example that we went through, 10 grams of, of protein and, and roughly, and we've balanced it with these amino acids and it's now a nice diet for, for the bird, except because millet is full of starch. Millet is a typical cereal grain, full of starch. And everybody would tell you that if, if you were feeding 100 grams of millet, the bird will eat 100 grams of sunflower seed and there's tons of protein in sunflower seed, so they're not going to get protein deficient and there's tons of energy and everybody will tell you your bird will get fat. Um, what will actually happen? Actually, the bird will probably only eat 40 grams of sunflower seed. Because there's so much more energy and protein in, uh, in, in sunflower seed than there is in millet, in a, an oily food versus a starchy food, the bird may only eat 40 grams, and if it only eats 40 grams, it's getting its 10 grams of protein, so it's not going to be protein deficient. Actually, it's going to be energy deficient. It's not going to have enough energy. Now, birds aren't stupid. If they haven't got enough energy, they're like us. They get hungry, so they eat. So this scenario, whilst it may be theoretically uh, a problem, isn't a problem, because the reality is he won't eat 40 grams of sunflower seed, it'll eat 60 grams of sunflower seed. It will eat until its energy requirement is met. And at, the, at that point, if it was just being fed sunflower seed purely, it would have more protein than it needs. Not a major issue, again, unless there are, unless there are issues with livers and, and kidneys. So, clearly you don't feed your birds a diet 100% millet or 100% sunflower seed. I've just picked those as examples of, of the extremes, if you like. The reality is sunflower uh, is a very good food for parrots. We, there, it gets more complicated and I haven't got time to go into omega-3s and omega-6s and all the sorts of different oils, but nevertheless, don't have come down badly on sunflower seed. And then here is the, the issue. I've sort of, if, if, we, if we look at those charts and we go, all oh, percentages and calories and goodness knows what else, it all seems very complicated and very scientific. And by the way, my biggest hobby horse is that we are not in a science-based industry. We're in a, we're in a technology industry. We run field trials. We don't do proper scientific experiments. The number of scientific experiments carried out on pet parrot species is tiny. Tiny, absolutely tiny. 
So the question is, do we have to get all those percentages and things right? And the answer is no, we don't, because the birds are not stupid. So long as we feed them a choice, so here I've just got a typical sort of parity mix, which is relatively low in protein. We've got here, this is an egg food, and our feast egg food, but you might have fruits and vegetables and things like that. You start adding your supplements to this, you're boosting the usable quality or the quality of the protein. And what the birds will do, very simply, is they will select how much of this and how much of that they need. They will get the whole protein and energy balance absolutely right without you worrying about it. All you have to do is offer something with a lowish protein and something with a highish protein and they will make the selection. And in that sense, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm a supplements person and I'm fairly passionately um, not a great fan of pellets. The problem with, pe one of the problems with pellets is that the pellet manufacturers will tell you that they've got a scientifically formulated <coughs> formulation, but it's interesting how some of them have got 15% protein and some of them have got 22% protein and the science doesn't actually come to the same answers. A lot of the science is still based on poultry nutrition, which is a bit sad. Um, so again, our philosophy, give them a choice, and hey presto, you won't have a problem. Okay, um, because the thing said I've got to talk about supplements, I'll talk about the supplements from our range that we would do this with. Um, there are, this, this little gaggle here is a product called Daily Essentials 3. Uh, this is our primary, most important vitamin, mineral, and in the context of this discussion, amino acid supplement. So if you feed Daily Essentials 3 as a vitamin supplement, you get the amino acids that we were talking about and you balance the protein and your birds get that benefit pretty well free. Um, more recently we've produced, uh, the Daily Essentials 3 is designed to be used with other supplements. Uh, we've got a, a range called Easy Bird now which uh, combines, um, combines a lot more things all in one, uh, but again, it's got all those limiting amino acids in it. Um, our egg foods, and this is uh, our parrot feast, uh, likewise also have vitamins, minerals, and amino acids in. And we've got a product, which I haven't got on here, which is a complete feed, which is called Banquet. And Banquet is basically a mixture of feast and a seed package. slight movement away from what we're saying and, and that's the importance of protein and breeding and that the, the key issue here is that babies need a huge amount more protein or at least the ratio between protein and energy they need is much higher and the reason for that is that there are two primary requirements for energy the first one is the energy just to re repair and renew our bodies so everybody sitting there, you may not think you're using energy, but your bodies are turning over and metabolizing things and whatever. And so you have to eat, even if you're a sedentary, lazy sod like me, you've still got to eat something just to keep yourself going. And the baby birds are exactly the same. So your little baby African grey or whatever has a requirement of, for energy just to maintain its body temperature and all those sorts of things. But it also has another energy requirement, which is the energy required to grow. Um, and it needs protein to do that growing. And when the baby is very small, one, one of the things that's a mystery to me about, about most animals when they grow is they don't grow by, say, 10% a day or 2% a day. Um, my wife and I used to keep um, cattle and, and the cattle grow a, a kilogram a day. It doesn't matter whether they're tiny little things that start at 30 kilograms. They go 30, 31, 32, 33. And when they're up to 400 kilos, they're still going 400, 401, 402. They sort of grow at the same amount a day. And our birds are the same. They put on huge amounts over the first few weeks. They're much, much more in percentage terms. So they need a lot more protein but they also need a lot more energy. And that ratio changes. As they get bigger and bigger, the maintenance requirement gets larger, 
but the growth requirement doesn't change. So they need more energy to maintain themselves, they need protein for growth and that amount of protein doesn't change, but they need more and more energy. So you'll find that if you, um, if you offer your, your breeding birds, just as I said earlier, a high protein feed and a low protein feed, the adult birds will take the right mix of those to suit the chicks that they're feeding at the time. This is the main reason why parent red bir reared birds tend to grow faster than hand reared birds. Because hand reared birds are fed a protein energy ratio that's only right for one day. It's wrong leading up to that day and it's wrong in the opposite direction after that day. And, and so I'm not saying you shouldn't hand rear birds by the way, I'm just saying that, that parent reared given a choice will do much better. I think I've said that, It'll be typical. So just to re-emphasize that, offer them a high protein feed, offer them a low protein feed and let the parents sort it out. You simply don't need to do that. I actually learnt this lesson in really big terms from a Zimbabwean uh, ostrich breeder and uh, he's probably been massacred by people since then but um, he, he, used to, he used to weigh all of his young ostriches as they grew uh, once a week um, and, and he plotted a lovely graph of how, how fast they were growing and as their, as their growth rates tailed off he changed the protein energy ratio of the diet and they took off and started growing really fast again and then they'd tail off and he, he had five different feeds with different protein and energy ratios. So that's where when I say you're hand rearing food with one ratio is very is basically not going to be right. So same slide as before, high protein food, lower protein food, let them sort it out. So here's the summary of the first half. I'm doing okay, just. Um, if you balance the diet with limiting amino acids, you will basically prevent obesity and prolong happy lives. And I think you know, the reality is the number of times I've spoken to Alan over the years and we talk about birds that come into the vet clinic and they're 25 or 30, um, they may not be overweight by the way, by the time you have caused that liver disease that uh, obesity causes, they have often lost a lot of weight. And I've, uh, uh, I, mean, I used to do uh, a lot of club talks where I used to show people how to use a crop tube and I used to use budgerigars and some of the budgerigars I was given were just wobbly dolps of jelly. They were so obese and so fat. So we fix that, lysine and methionine um, and it's easy to put in supplements. Um, growing babies need more protein and yes, give an option for them to choose. Now, I'm not sure whether this is going to work, um, just because just me talking is probably dull. Um, I'm just going to show you, we're on, we're on feeding babies thing, so I'm just going to show you a very short 30 second video I took in Australia last October. No, I'm not. <laughs> if I can, if it works, yes, here we go. Oh, you. There you go. So at least 30 seconds of today's talk will be interesting. And that, was, that, was, that was it. Okay. Um, oh, hang on. We don't need to see it twice, do we? Oh, no. Wait. Do we do? We'll watch it again. What I love about this, I'm going to deviate a bit, but um, let's just see if I can. I don't know how to get to. I don't know how to get to the next slide now. Yes, I do. I can overrule it. Ah, defeated by the technology. There we go. Um, when I go to Australia, I do not get a chance to to take pictures of birds and things like that. Um, but just occasionally, 
uh, I will. And what I love about the galahs there, um, the, that colour looks totally false, doesn't it? But actually, if you go out, uh, this, is in, um, this is in Queensland, this is about two hours west of Brisbane, you go out at 4.30, between 4.30 and 5 o'clock, and it's getting dark by 5.15. You go out at that time and you've got really low sun, and they just go this beautiful flame red. They are, they are a red and grey parrot at that time of day. They're just lovely. Okay, any questions anybody wants to throw at me on protein and energy? Yeah. Right. On tomatoes and what have you, she, she will, she'll stop eating the Yeah, yeah and, and that can be a challenge. Um, so, question. sorry, yes, so the question, thank you Sally. The question, the question was uh, parrotlets that are, are offered a range of different th feeds but they won't eat the, they won't eat the egg food. Um, my answer to that is, is take the feeds that they do eat, so if, maybe it's the fruit and veggies or whatever. Chop it up very small, because one of the irritating things about parrots, if you give them a piece of apple, they'll take a bite out and throw the rest on the floor. So, so, so you need to chop your food up small, and you need to offer them an amount of food that is roughly proportional to what they're going to eat. You add all your supplements to that, so, so if you're feeding fruits and vegetables, add your supplements to chop, finely chop fruits and vegetables, and you shouldn't have a problem. Um, and if they don't want to eat egg food, they don't want to eat egg food. You know, it's not the end of the world. Um, you know, so long as they're getting a supplemented feed, and you know, I'm not going to talk about all the roles of the vitamins and minerals, but so long as you're getting that, those things into them, it frankly doesn't matter how you get it in. You're not going to add it to the seed because, because they're going to take the husk off and lose it. But fruit and veggies, um, sprouted seeds, um, and egg foods if they'll eat it. But yeah, so don't get locked into me saying, showing you a picture of an egg food. Anything else? Yeah. You mentioned um, different types of protein, not, uh, amino acids not found in fruit and veg. Yeah. Would you suggest um, animal forms, so mealworms, crickets, that yeah. sort of thing? Yeah. So firstly, um, those amino acids are there, but they're not in large quantity. So, so they are deficient, but not but they are, they are there to a certain extent. But yes, if you can get your, your birds to eat an animal protein, because the egg food, you know, has most got a bit of egg in it, not very much, but a bit. Uh, we actually use dairy protein um, for, for boosting with animal protein, but insect stuff and whatever, fine, absolutely fine. And, and the reality is, you know, uh, people don't realise that in the wild, even birds like budgerigars that we think do nothing but eat millet, in the wild they're eating tons of insects around breeding time and things like that, uh, as, as do a lot of our European birds. So yeah, I have no problem with that. Any others quickly? At the back there? Yeah. Yeah. I personally wouldn't, because because sorry, the question was would I uh, would I feed soya to breeding birds, um, and and my my answer to that is I personally would never put soya in a in a breeding bird product, uh, simply because the phytoestrogens are going to have a negative impact on the males. They may be fine for the females. The story that got me convinced of this, and I used to work for a, for a horrible firm called Monsanto, and Monsanto, I was not in the Roundup business, and I was, and I was out of it, I was selling plastics for them, and that's awful now, isn't it? But, uh, but, but Monsanto produced uh, all of these um, Roundup ready soya uh, products. And uh, apart from the fact that Roundup itself is now proving to be dangerous, we didn't know that 30 odd years ago, but we do now. Um, it meant that, uh, that people started growing much, much more soya. And the story that really got me was Mexico. Now we all associate Mexico with corn, don't we? Maize, right? And they were an economy, an agricultural economy based on maize. When Roundup Ready Soya came along, 
they switched over and they started growing soya because it was more profitable. And they also started eating more soya. And young Mexican girls reached puberty a year earlier. And I go, wow, this is, I don't, I don't like it. Okay, right. Anyway, any others? No, I'll, I'll move on to calcium now, if you don't mind. So, this is really just to say that, um, that nutrition is not, not the science we think it is, and, um, and a lot of what we thought we understood a while ago, we don't, and I'm sure that is still true of loads of other things that we think we understand. So, what we now know about calcium and what we used to say about it are quite different. What I will say, though, is when we started back in 1994, in October, we placed adverts for our disinfectant products because that's what we thought was odd and different and, and innovative and whatever. And we started in October 1994, and all we did was when we sent an order out, we put a price list in with it. And that was all the promotion we did for our calcium supplement was stick a price list out with people who bought, to people who bought disinfectant. By December, so two months later, the chelated calcium product, the calcium supplement, was our biggest selling product. And every single month of every single year since December 1994, our calcium technology has been our biggest seller. And the reality is we didn't really know why. Parrot talk, horses. The, what, what has got us to understand why is, is a slightly bizarre story, but, but it's the work we do on horses. And, uh, and basically, to cut a long story short, um, I, I started riding as a 49-year-old, which is pretty stupid, and I bought a thoroughbred, which are notoriously spooky and difficult to ride. And I was told not to do this. <laughs> by slightly younger and wiser people. And uh, anyway, Paddy, Paddy, my lovely chestnut thoroughbred, um, was a nightmare, and I didn't know what to do with him. And, and he couldn't, in a million years, be calcium deficient, because we live on top of the Cotswolds, and there's limestone all over the place. So he couldn't, you would never have thought of giving him a calcium supplement. Um, and eventually, out of sheer desperation, well, no, before desperation, I used all the supplements that the horse people sell you and mostly magnesium supplement, they, they didn't do anything. We now know why, but we didn't then. So, so we gave him magnesium supplements, they didn't work. And then, hey presto, we thought, okay, if Paddy was a parrot, what would we do? And the connection we had made years earlier was that we get all these oven-ready, feather-plucked parrots, and we've got all sorts of training regimes, and I'm not you know, those, those are fine, and we've got you know, really good animal behavior people here who understand these things. But the reality was, if you didn't give them a calcium supplement, all the training in the world didn't seem to be very successful. So we'd sort of made that observation in parrots, and we effectively said, well, if parrot, Paddy was a parrot, what would we do? Glug, we took our liquid calcium product, poured it down his throat, and 25 minutes later he went, <sighs> and we went, we have no idea what we have done here. Since then, the reason for this Olympic, um, Olympic event rider from New Zealand, uh, we've got British dressage riders with gold, silver and bronze Olympic medals now, um, all on basically parrot, parrot calcium supplements. Um, <laughs> And the reason I keep going to Australia is um, because they have a particular problem. They poison their horses, not intentionally. They love their horses just as the way you love your parrots, and they love their cattle just the way. But they've got pastures that are really poisonous, and it turns out that chelated calcium is the perfect antidote. So, so what we now know about calcium, we've learned from horses, but it's just as true of the birds. So I'm going to give you a very brief chemistry lesson that you don't need to worry about. When, when, I, when I used to do my bird club talks early on, I had a jam jar of water with a crushed up cuttlefish bone in it. And my comment was, look, I can walk around with this for years. I had it for years, um, and most of it doesn't dissolve very well. And so, uh, so actually, cuttlefish bone was never a particularly good calcium supplement. 
But when it does dissolve, this is calcium carbonate or limestone or cuttleship cuttlefish bone or oyster shell grit, they're all chemically a calcium and this carbonate bit. And when it dissolves, it separates out and you get calcium and you get carbonate. A chelated calcium, this is, this is calcium gluconate. This is what you'll find in our CalciVet product. And you can see there's calcium in the middle and two sugar molecules each side of it. Um, that dissolves as it is. Again, it doesn't dissolve all that nicely, but it dissolves as it, as it is. And the key point about that, which we only worked out a few years ago, is that it doesn't supply calcium. <laughs> right? That first one separates out, gives your bird calcium. This stuff doesn't, doesn't supply calcium at all. And yet every vet that sticks this into your, you know, this is what they, the vets will inject into them, he's thinking it's a calcium supplement. But it's not. He's Alan gone before I've offended him. <laughs> <laughs> So we've now got to ask this question, and, and I, could, I could bore you to tears, I can tell you, with blood tests we've done on horses and hormone analysis and all sorts of things, and, and I'd fall asleep, so I don't think sure you will. But, so I'm just going to tell you sort of what chelated calcium does. Um, and the first answer is it does everything, which is a bit scary. Almost every cell in our body uses this process here called calcium signaling. Now, when I went to university, nobody would heard of calcium signaling, right? Absolutely nobody. Um, guy got the Nobel Prize in 2013 for the work he did on calcium signaling. It started, that work started in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and billions and billions of research dollars have been spent understanding this process. But interestingly enough, that chelated calcium molecule I showed you is completely invisible to all the tests that the guys doing this research do. They cannot see it. Their, their systems all, all simply aren't looking at it and aren't looking for it. But one of the things that chelated calcium does is it regulates ordinary calcium. It helps with that regulatory process. Which is why when you give uh, a bird that looks calcium deficient a chelated calcium supplement, you correct the way it regulates its calcium, and it gets better again, even though you haven't actually given it calcium. It's very confusing, isn't it? The word calcium appears five times too often, and it's very, very difficult to get your head around it. But chelated calcium does different things. So let me give you first comment. Chelated calcium deficiency is incredibly common. It's common in humans. It's common in horses. It's common in cattle. It's common in birds. Um, the symptoms are very rarely recognized simply because people have not seen the huge breadth of things that it do even in acute cases they don't necessarily recognize that they've got a problem and we are in an area because the science that's being done on a related area uh, doesn't see these molecules there is basically no science on this and uh, a friend and neighbor of ours is, is professor of uh, of neuroscience and pharmacology at Bristol University and uh, while she finds what I tell her really interesting there's no money ever going to look at it because Big Pharma is not interested in something that's going to put their drugs out of business. So what does chelated calcium help with? Firstly strengthens st structure of bones, there's no surprise in that is there? But it's not because it's providing the calcium. In, in our horse work in Australia we actually take the calcium supplements away from these horses give them a tiny bit of this and these are horses with really weak and, and demineralized bones and their bones sort themselves out even though they're getting less calcium. So chelated calcium is regulating it. The most common ones you will see are rickets and splayed, uh, splayed legs in babies. That's not so much, a, especially the splayed legs, is not necessarily a bone issue, it's a muscle issue, it's the muscles not holding the legs where they belong. So not surprisingly, nerves and muscles start functioning properly uh, when we give them chelated calcium. Uh, a, a good example of this, slightly different from rickets and whatever, when we had an ostrich industry in this country, which didn't, didn't last long, um, they're feeding, they're fe they were feeding their birds incredibly high protein diets. These things were growing incredibly fast. And what they got was a leg rotation. The legs started twisting around because the 
because the muscles were not holding it in the right place. And the vets were going, oh, the flooring's a problem and this, that, and the other. Um, absolutely guarantee you we would stop leg rotation overnight with a chelated calcium supplement. Now, those birds, those birds were on really high calcium diets. They were on pretty well 3% calcium, and normal would be 1% calcium. And yet it didn't stop that problem, but chelated calcium did. Egg binding in hens, uh, classic problem. Um, poor shell quality and small clutches. Falling off perches. African greys seem to do it in the middle of the night. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's interesting because there does seem to be a temperature relationship to this too. So African greys don't fall off during the day, but if their body temperature drops, I don't know, half a degree or something overnight, they will fall off. And what's happening? They can't grip anymore. Their nerves and muscles have stopped functioning. Uh, they don't do it on chelated calcium supplements. Poor coordination and flying. Uh, Fits and seizures, these are getting serious by now, I have to say, and tragically we've, we've over the years treated quite a lot of, treated, I'm not allowed to say that, am I? Um, dealt with a number of birds that have been on all sorts of anti-convulsive drugs and things like that. Um, and if you get them quickly enough with chelated calcium, you fix them. Fear and aggression, um, if your bird's brain is not working properly, which it won't, if it becomes chelated calcium, uh, deficient, it will start to, uh, it'll, it'll feel nervous. Uh, this, this, this is our business in horses, by the way, is fear and aggression. We sell chelated calcium to get the brain working properly, and at that point they don't have to be nervous and spooky and whatever. Self-mutilation, sort of where we started, not understanding it. So the reason these, these symptoms are commonly misdiagnosed by vets is firstly, so all of those things like muscles and nerves, they don't really associate with calcium. They think calcium bones, teeth, that's about it. Secondly, you can do a, a blood test for total blood calcium. It tells you absolutely nothing about the amount of chelated calcium in the system, and there is no blood test for chelated calcium. So all the research we've done has been really difficult to deal with. And sadly, we've been selling, oh, not, not us, because we we were lucky we, we came across chelated calcium by accident, but, but people have been stuffing your parrot pellets full of limestone and dicalcium phosphate um, and offering, telling you that cuttlefish bones are the best thing since iced bread and whatever. And the reality is um, they don't do what chelated calcium does. So the key point here is that, is that wild birds don't get their calcium by going and eating cuttlefish bone. I, you know, again, I've been, been in central Queensland recently. I didn't see a lot of cuttlefish. And so, so the, the birds there are, are getting their calcium and their chelated calcium and most of their other nutrients from green sappy seeds. Right? We feed our birds on dry seed. And this is a really important distinction. The reason we feed dry seed is simple. We can store it. It doesn't go mouldy. The reason Australian farmers hate cockatoos is because the cockatoos are smart enough to be on the, the grain when it's still green and sappy and fresh and full of nutrients before the farmer can harvest it. And actually, I, I should have shown, I've got a video of a sorghum field covered in, covered in um, sulfur crested cockatoos. So, so the, cocky, the, co the farmers there really hate the cockies. But green sappy seeds seem to have more, uh, more chelated calcium in them. And this is just one of the, the things from years ago that we worked out. Owls are, are about the only bird of prey that eats their prey whole. So they eat the meat, the feather, the gut, the bone. And what do they do? They expel a pellet with the feather protein, which by the way is very rich in methionine, this stuff we thought was important, but they can't get that methionine out of it. So the feather is useless to them and the pellet's got the bone in it. So if, if, if bone was a good source of calcium that owls needed, they wouldn't have learnt to spit it out. They'd keep it inside. So, use chelated calcium supplements. Um, 
Most of them are liquids, not all of them. We've had to, we've had to develop powdered ones for the horse industry because the liquid ones are frankly too expensive to put down uh, an animal as large as a horse. Um, add it to soft foods or fresh foods wherever, po wherever possible. This is just a, another one of my hobby horses. Uh, if your birds are eating fresh fruits and vegetables, they will be getting all of their water requirements from that and they won't drink. So don't put supplements in the water unless your birds are on a really dry diet. Right? Uh, also, we can't put the methionine in, uh, in the water unless you want your bird's water to smell of rotten cabbages. So, so there are two good reasons not to put supplements in water. Uh, we, do, we do have in water supplements for desperate measures. But and, and one of the things that we have we, we learned the hard way about chelated calcium supplements is that they're best not given every day. Um, the birds are better off having a break from them and when they have a break from them they actually learn to regulate them properly and we get much, much better results. So, uh, so in, in horse behaviour we get better consistent results when we feed it inconsistently. So you'll find that our recommendation is uh, twice a week for non-breeding birds and five times a week for breeding birds. And that break just, just helps them. And yes, yeah, another one of my hobby horses. Um, the number of people that will phone us up and say, oh, well, I've been using your calci vet and my bird's still lying on its back with its feet in the air. And you go, okay, how much are you doing? Oh, I put three drops a day in. Okay, all right. Yeah, give the amount that it tells you to give and, uh, and you will probably do okay. So these are our chelated calcium supplements that in the UK they're all called CalciVet so uh, you, can, you can buy the liquid version from 50 mils to 5 litres um, but we've also got powdered versions here and, and this is just a good example of things going in circles if you like. We, we made the observation on parrots and behaviour, we took that to horses, we, that forced us to produce uh, powdered supplements because they were much cheaper. It's quite expensive to make these liquids. And hey presto, that means we can offer you guys powdered supplements. I think this is almost a statement of the obvious. If they're going to be deficient in one nutrient, they're going to be deficient in a whole pile of other nutrients. So I'm not a huge fan of just picking individual you know, give, give this, this bird vitamin B6 or something like that. Give a broad spectrum supplement, uh, such as our Daily Essentials 3 or our Easy Birds. Um, and this is a, a, oh, sorry. a fi final comment down at the bottom here. No pellets contain chelated calcium. So if you're feeding pellets, you can't be feeding chelated calcium. There's no problem with feeding a chelated calcium supplement on top of your pellet. So, yep, my talk on supplements. High protein food for breeders, uh, vitamin, mineral, amino acid product for everything, calcium supplement for everything, really good probiotic, and, and almost everything all in one product, not quite. And I think, just to keep you amused and get another 30 seconds of interesting stuff, hopefully. Sulfur crested cockatoos. Last week. So you now had two 30 second bits that were interesting. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> now I've got the same technology, <laughs> beaten, beaten by technology, go away. So thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Alan, Alan's arrival told me that I must be finishing. So actually, surprisingly, I sensed you were getting near the end. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Malcolm. Um, it will be
would be nice to see cockatoos in those numbers flying free. Unfortunately, yet I've not, I've not yet got to Australia, but one day. Over here, we get ringneck parakeets in similar numbers. <laughs> um, I can't count the number of phone calls I used to have as a practicing avian vet saying, my African grey's just had a fit, my African grey's just fallen off its perch. What do I do? Calcium supplementation, improve the diet, and instant cure. Um, that's the answer. As I said at the beginning, so many disease problems in parrots are the result of faulty nutrition. We do have time for a few questions. Jane had a hand up at the front. Let's I was going to say, is there a risk from if you already give a healthy diet uh, over supplementation? Okay. So was if you yeah. Go on. already give a healthy diet, is it possible to over supplement? Um, I'm going to be a little controversial here. Uh, I have not yet met uh, an animal keeper of any sort that does not think that they're giving a healthy diet. So, so, so my, my first question will always be, okay, so what are you actually feeding? Uh, secondly, um, uh, it used to be, when we first started, one of my biggest gripes was that Cajun Avery birds, bless them, whenever they wrote, had an article in that said uh, you should give a vitamin supplement, they always put a sentence, 100% of the time, but be careful you can overdose on vitamins. Now, if you actually look at the science, it is virtually impossible. And for years and years, and I've never seen anything since, the only example of overdosing vitamins was done on, um, it, was, it was two, one was a cockatoo and one was a macaw being hand-reared in America and the owner had gone to his local pet shop and he had bought what he thought was an electrolyte solution but it turned out to be a very concentrated vitamin D supplement and he fed them to, to his birds um, and sadly one of them died and, but once the vet worked out what he was doing they stopped it and the other bird recovered completely uh, he was giving a thousand times the recommended dose of vitamin D now that gets wheeled out as an example of overdosing vitamins. Well, okay, um, yeah, that, that will kill them. Uh, the reality is now, and, and uh, I pick vitamin D because it's a very good example. Back then, the poultry research suggested that four times the recommended level of vitamin D was dangerous. And uh, actually, that was based on vitamin D2, which is pretty well an artificial factory made version and no bird, no bird feed or supplements company would use D2. So D3 turns out to be much safer. Then we look at, uh, we go to some human stuff and a, a very good friend of mine in Melbourne um, studies a campaign, uh, she, she's a marketing professor and she studies social media campaigns and and in Australia, when Sally and I moved out there in the early 80s, they just started a campaign called Slip Slap Slop. And Slip Slap Slop was trying to stop all these Aussies who were driving along with their windows open, getting cancer on their right arms. And, and Australia had one of the highest skin cancer rates. And uh, believe me, I am going to get back to vitamins in a minute. Um, Slip slap slot was, you know, put factor 50 on and wear a hat and sleeves and all that sort of stuff. And what it did when it was, when it was analysed later, it was one of the most successful social media campaigns ever, right? Australians are now the most vitamin D deficient nation in the world. <laughs> and their cancer rates have not changed. Right? They have a slightly different blend of skin cancers, but they still have skin cancers. So vitamin D, is, uh, we, Linda herself, who has freckles and really pale skin, uh, now takes on prescription a vitamin supplement that is probably 10 times the original recommended dose, and we were all told would kill your birds. So, yeah, I think that the simple answer to your question is no, they're not going to overdose vitamins. Thank you. Um, we have two African greys, and um, we tend to put the calcium bear in their water because I felt that that was more, get, you know, they're guaranteed to drink, so they'll get it because they tend to waste a lot of the fresh fruit and veg that they get every day. So what's the best thing to do then? Um, my, my preference is that you chop the fresh fruit up really small, sort of uh, five mil cube, something like that. Only offer them the amount that they're likely to eat and put the supplement in there. 
you will you will spend a lot less money on supplement because you'll throw away a lot less because you put it in the water you throw most of it away so I'm talking myself out of a bit of business here but but that would be my preference and if you do that and you just feed them a little bit say early in the morning and they clear it all up and you want to give them more fresh fruit and let them play with it yeah we'll do that later on and you know how much they've got and we're talking about a milliliter uh, for a pair of African greys is, is roughly your dose and twice a week when they're, if they're not breeding. Any more? Any more questions? I'm sure Malcolm will happily answer a few more if you can't speak to him afterwards. Yep. Oh, and, and I'll be downstairs on our little stand. Anyway. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. one more, one more. Is there a preference with the calcium? Is there a preference more form to the liquid to the, the powder form? Um, no is the no is the answer but but I, you, you'll only find a chelated calcium in powder form from us because nobody else is doing it um, and uh, but no there isn't um, there there are there are chelates and chelates I showed you calcium gluconate um, and it seems to be something to do with the size of the molecule we're not absolutely sure what's going on but um, if the molecule gets too small it doesn't work so things like lactate doesn't seem to work as well as as, um, as calcium gluconate does, for example. Um, exactly why that is, I don't know. But lactate doesn't. And and when we talked about the Australian horses being poisoned, they're actually being poisoned by chelated calcium, which is oxalate, which is a very small molecule, um, and and doesn't seem to do the right things. So, uh, yeah, you can buy a powder, you can buy a liquid. It's going to cost you about the same to apply it. If you're adding it to an egg food, frankly, it's easier to add a powder than a, than a liquid. So, okay, thank you very much indeed. Our next presentation will be held up here at one o'clock, but if it's Steve Brooks talking about his fantastic character. Enjoy the rest of the day.